of NAPE. Uh, and this one is uh, virtual. Our first meeting was uh, uh, physical stroke uh, virtual. Uh, we are glad to bring to you today's uh, presentation. Uh, like earlier on said, our Emmanuel Chidi is the one that will chair today's uh, presentation. I'm glad to announce the presence of my president on board here, uh, the president of NAPE, Mrs. Patricia Chobu, F. NAPE. My president, you are welcome this morning. We'll Thank take... you very much, Potako Chapter, for inviting us. Thank We're you. We're happy to be here. Thank you, ma'am. Opening remarks, uh, presentation, Q and A, but I will tweak a little here before we take the Q and A. The president will come up with our remarks. We'll take the Q and A, and then uh, we have five minutes for the electoral board to make their own uh, uh, little presentation. Things to let us understand concerning the elections we have at hand. So co to continue here now, I will invite uh, uh, Philip Ajebili, the Port Harcourt chapter secretary to take an opening uh, prayer very quickly. I also welcome our PE, Dr. James Edet. Doc, you are welcome. So Philip, thank you quickly very much. An, thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you Philip, very much. Quickly Good take morning. An opening prayer. Yeah. No problem, thanks very much. Good morning all. Um, let us, um, let's, let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the life that you've given to each and every one of us. We thank you for having brought us thus far. Even as we're about to start our session, we pray that you guide us. We pray that you also open our eyes of understanding so that everything that we shared here will grasp and benefit from it to the glory of your name. All that we'll do today, we hand over to you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Over to Amen. you, sir. Amen. Thank you, Philip. Um, I will call on uh, the chairman of this uh, presentation, uh, Mr. Emmanuel Chidi, uh, to take over at this point. Emmanuel, you will introduce the speaker and then uh, he will carry on with the presentation. I want to welcome uh, Christopher Jackson, our able uh, editor in chief. Uh, thank Emmanuel you very much. Over. Yeah, thank you. Okay, good morning, everybody in the house. I'm standing on the existing protocol. I want to thank you as many that made themselves available for today's uh, technical meeting. Though we are very far, we are connected to these platforms from our homes, from our offices, but we can still interact with one another. Thank God for technology. Though COVID-19 had intended to separate us, the two technologies will still connect with one another. Now, as regards to today's uh, technical uh, meeting, the topic, the main, which topic is integration of gas chromatographic carbon count ratio in near field exploration and in field drilling results. The subject of gas chromatography is very, is key in oil and gas industry. For today's meeting, we have somebody that is going to talk to us on this subject. He is a senior geologist with mobile, with Monopolo. Okay. Monopolo. Monopolo, Petron Development Limited. He had his bachelor's degree in geological science, master's degree in applied geophysics, and recently completed a doctorate degree in petroleum geology. He was, a student, he was a student chapter president of NAPE at the University from 2008 to 2009. And the NAPE YP lead in 2018. 
He started his career as a graduate intern geologist in SPDC, after which he worked for Nubian Group Nigeria Limited, airing energy and a short stint at laser engineering and resources consultants limited as a senior reservoir geologist. He has worked in exploration, development, production, and where operation teams. He, was a, he has evaluated various fuels in onshore and or offshore Niger Delta, Calabar flag, and the West Africa transfer margin. He is a recipient of 2015 Best Geology Paper Presenter at the Society of Exploration to this its IGSC conference in Prague, Czech Republic. He is a member of NAPE, AAPG, SEG, EAG, SPE and NGA. Ladies and gentlemen, I can see that he's a powerful guy. This is not that person that doctor, David Anomese. David, you are welcome. Take the center stage. You're welcome. Thank you all. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Emmanuel Chile. So I think I can now share my screen. Yes. You can go ahead and share the screen. It's an I'm trying to do that. Please confirm you can see my screen. Yes. I no. Okay. All right. Thank you yes, very much. That's it. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, today is uh, one of the happiest days of my life. Reason being, uh, this is the first time I was speaking to the NAPI community at large and making a technical presentation during a monthly technical meeting. I remember back in the days uh, during my undergraduate studies. I usually make out time to visit NAPI technical meetings and learn from other people when they are presenting. Sometimes it becomes so complex that I do not understand what they are saying, but I try to just jot as much I can on my jotter to have at least something to go home with. But today I'm happy that I'll be presenting to the same group of people, more or less uh, the highly experienced and also uh, those that are earlier in the career as well. So I appreciate this opportunity to present to NAPI and um, I'm pleased and hope that we'll be able to learn and share ideas together from this presentation. So the cause of this presentation, the title is the integration of gas chromatography carbon count ratio in exploration and in field drilling results. For the outline, we'll be discussing briefly on the introduction. We're looking at the various rule of thumb for applying carbon count ratios. We're looking at a, an exploration case study. We're looking at a development horizontal drilling case study. Then we'll be looking at the relationship between carbon count ratio and uh, gas oil ratio, then we'll have some conclusions. Gas chromatography is a common type of chromatography that is used in separating various compounds, and it's usually connected in the model logging unit in every drilling operation. The gas chromatograph breaks the component of the total gas from C1 to C5. The final carbon counts that are produced are available as logs and analyzed for that using various ratios, usually ranging from C1 to C2 to C1 to C5 and other empirical equations that can actually help you to get your wetness ratio, your character ratio, and your balance ratio. The gas chromatographic carbon ratio is among the earliest data received during drilling and can be utilized for formation evaluation. However, most times, it seems during, uh, uh, during the evaluation of the uh, model logging data, the focus is usually lithology, checking of fluorescence, and streaming. And there's a very minor focus on how to actually make use of this carbon, gas carbon count to actually separate various fluid types. That's and which is the reason for this presentation. So here we're just trying to elaborate more on, uh, on the function of carbon count ratio and how it has actually been useful in the industry. And one of the earliest plots that have been used in this case is the, what they call the PISLA plot. And PISLA plots works with using different carbon count ratios from C1, C2, C1, C3, C1, C4, and C1, C5. And now I try to pinpoint, especially I try to give a, a very specific uh, values with respect to the Niger Delta for oil based on the experience I have so far. And you can see for your C1, C2, you expect your oil to be between two to 12. For your C1 to C3, you expect it to be between two to 15. And for your C1, C4, you expect it to be between two to 60. So the higher the values, the closer you are to the gas. So, but for this one, one thing about it is also there's some uncertainties that comes in which 
I have to also share with you here, which is one of the things you can find on the limitations here. So what is part of those uncertainties? Apart from the fact that you can actually be able to pinpoint the area that corresponds to your poison zone, your gas zone, and the non-productive zone, the other limitations one has to bear in mind. One is, if productive dry gas zones, it may show only C1, that it might have only methane, and a very high methane can also be indicative of C1, can also be indicative of salt water. So those are one of the limitations to look out for. Also, if the C1, C2 ratio falls low in the oil section, and the C1, C4 ratio falls very high in the gas section, the zone is probably a non-productive zone. If any ratio is lower than a precedent ratio, the zone is probably non-productive as well. For instance, if C1, C4 ratio is less than C1, C2, the zone is probably wet. The ratios may not be definitive for tight and low and low uh, permeability zones. Then also go on to look at the typical natural gas composition. Either looking at whether you're looking at an associated gas field or a non-associated gas field. That's if you're looking at oil from an associated gas field, or you're looking at you know just a completely non-associated gas. Now there are various components that you can find from these uh, these various gases, carbon counts, starting from your methane down to your butane, your pentane. Which of them we're looking at? The focus which for us here is just to look at okay, what are the composition? So if I start with the first one, which is the methane. If you look at the dry gas for methane for non-associated gas, you see it's 94. Now, when I look at that for associated gas, it's 54. What that tells me is that if I'm dealing with a non-associated gas, I'm expected to have high volumes of methane as compared to when I'm dealing with what associated gas from the oil field. Now, when we go to the last, to the last, that's the C5H10. What we look at again for dry gas, what is happening? You have relatively low dry gas uh, volume, which is about 0.2 in terms of a uh, percent. More percent. Then when we look at the associated gas, you have 1.0. So what that tells us is that if you're in the gas zone, you expect to have more of methane. The methane is going to be very high. But when you're in the oil zone, you expect to have the higher components, which is the, the butane and the pertain, hopefully. So now we're going into looking at the, the examples that we're here to share. And we'll look, this is going to come from uh, the deep offshore environment of uh, Niger Delta, where a near field exploration was carried out. And here we have the well, we call it the well A2X. And I have a four block here, we have a four block A and four block B. And the four block B, you already have a producing well down four block B, which is actually doing perfect, perfectly well. So the plan is for us to see how we can target the four block A around the reservoir we call the U7U8, U6 reservoir. So we're believing that around the U6, there are some bright amplitudes from the maps and all the inversion studies that have been done that show that there's likelihood of finding hydrocarbon there. And we decided to go further to understand it. But also we noticed during the drilling that there was some, you know, there was more or less like the velocity was slower in this part of the, of the field. So we're going to carry on the assessment to water. It's really confirm if we're dealing with what we actually want to work with. So an assessment to water actually looks very cool. That means the velocity we have, the velocity data we have is actually good. The check shot, uh, the check shot data we have is actually a good one. Whereas as we're able to get a good time from here. Also trying to do a loop time from the very top of the world down to the reservoir section of interest. Also notice that there's a very good side in terms of uh, the world to seismic calibration. So we then went on to look at the, what is happening in terms of the logs. Now we've drilled this well, finally we've seen the sound of interest. The next question is if I've seen sand, does this sand actually contains hydrocarbon? Then we want to look at the resistivity data. It is actually, there's actually an increase in resistivity data well, it is not so clear, and I mean not so clear, it's not so pronounced. So we're having a resistivity of about uh, six, six to about 20, you know, ohm meters, which doesn't look so high in as much as it is, uh, it is a, 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 an anomaly on its own. But if we're dealing with a very tight sand or a very dirty sand, because this sand is actually, the, the way it is looking squashed, if I stretch it to see that those sands are clean, I would expect that my resistivity should get close to about 150 or thereabout. But for it to be as low as this begins to become a concern. So we're going to look at the neutron density crossover. It is looking like, oh, it's likely going to be oil. So those are some of the uncertainties we went, we, we looked into this uh, when we were looking at this uh, log, this results. So we went on to look at the, the pressure gradient. Plotted our pressure gradients. We already know that there are some ranges that you expect to find when you're when you're working with oil zone or when you're in the gas zone or when you're in the water zone. And the pressure gradient was actually corresponding to oil. So if this is really oil, would there be any other means we can actually do to actually confirm this? We know we can actually do normal testing and all of that, but we want to still do it, uh, work with the available data we have during the drilling process. 
Then we went on to now look at the carbon count ratio. We already know what to expect. If, for instance, we plot our carbon count ratio and it's corresponding to the oil zone, we we'll definitely know we're in oil. If it's corresponding to the gas zone, we we'll definitely know we're in the gas zone. If it's corresponding to a non-productive zone, we we'll definitely know. But if it is not corresponding to any of these, or it's falling into the limitations, such as where you have uh, the C1, C2 ratio falls low in the oil section, and C1, C4 ratio falls very high in the gas section, that zone is probably a non-productive zone. So those are some of the things we put into concepts. And we went on to look at the mod log. And this is a plot from the mod logging data. Fine, it was showing streaming, uh, 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 fluorescence, and all of that. When you look at the C1, C2 ratio, as you, it's, it's more or less changing as we're going from oil up into gas rapidly. So with that, that became a bit of a concern that what is really happening. We've already read in the limitations here that if to have this kind of rapid change, it shows that we are likely in a non-productive zone. So we went back to the adjacent field, adjacent field where we have our wells already producing. And we went to look at what is happening there to really understand, okay, what is really happening in terms of the carbon count ratio here. And this is what we have. So if the adjacent field is actually showing this for the carbon count ratio, we expect that the near field of what actually drilling should have this as well for looking at oil. If the neutron density is showing us oil, the pressure gradient is showing us oil, but the resistivity, we are having a bit of a, you know, skepticism and resistivity, then we should be able to, you know, get to improve our, you know, our chance of calling this oil or gas based on the carbon count ratio. And from the whole comparison, it turns out to be that what we're looking at is a non-producible hydrocarbon. So we just have uh, a, a, a more or less like a residual oil in that zone that has been washed off. Probably the hydrocarbon that have migrated to some other location, but it just left high imprints of its, uh, its uh, carbon compounds there. So at the end of the day, after comparing this, we discovered that the world has just been drilled from the carbon count ratio is a non-producible hydrocarbon oil. Why we have the well A1X, which is a producing field already, which has which is already everything is falling within the oil zone. We want to look at the second example. In the second example, we're looking at the development drilling for a horizontal well. And usually for some cases, when you're drilling horizontal wells, it's an idea that you have to drill a pilot well, or except you have a well close by where you can run an RST log to actually confirm the current saturation there. So with that, we went on to look at this, uh, this data. This is also an offshore data. And what we have is we have the, the pre-production stage and the post-production stage. So in the pre-production stage, you could notice something very clear. The oil and the gas are actually static. But as we've gone to the post-production stage, the oil has actually reduced in P thickness. However, the gas actually remains relatively the same. So there's no, that means the gas is not expanding, we're not doing that expanding gas at this, at this point. So and for this well, BX1 pilots and the BS horizontal, the plan is go through this pilot well, how do we now land the horizontal well? So this is the pilot well that has been drilled. You can see everything looks very good. We have the resistivity data, we have the, the gamma ray data, we have the neutron density. Everything is able to pick up the oil or the gas zone. And we we'll apply the rule of thumb. If our gas is not, is, is, not, is not expanding, the rule of thumb is to actually place your horizontal well in two to five ratio of your, of your oil interval. That's two, <clears throat> in terms of comparing from your oil and from, from your comparing, taking consideration from your gas zone, and from your water zone. So you do two to five rule of thumb to actually land your well. So before going that into landing the well, we understand there's something very unique about this pilot well. There are streaks of limestones and a very dormant amount of, uh, of calcite within these, uh, these uh, field. And once we've noticed that we have, it's not just within this well alone, we have them scattered around the field. So we have the like, small, small streaks. They are not very, so this actually brought about uh, us trying to understand what effects can these actually have? on these log responses and what, how can it affect what we're working on. So with that, we went on to now look at the work done by Glenda Smith in 2013. And this job is trying to look at, okay, what are the responses you can get from grass, gas crossover when you're dealing with sandstone and when you're dealing with limestone. And if you look at it very clearly, you see that for gas crossover for the sandstone, which is the top one, you see that the balloon is quite big. You have a bigger balloon. Then when you go to the, the next one, the gas crossover for the limestone, the balloon is also is quite small. So that means these limestones, since you have streaks of them in the reservoir, there are possibilities that it could actually be within the gas zone as you're moving from a bigger balloon to a smaller balloon. And in your mind, you're assuming that no, you're entering an oil zone. So those are one of the concerns. So even when you read your, 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 your pilot's work, going horizontally now, you want to be very cautious that you're landing as much as possible. 
into the oil zone because if the plan is for us to produce oil and not to get and to produce an oil with a low GR. So we went on. So this is like a real time view of this log. So we have the pilot well on the left. Then this is the entry point for the horizontal well on the right. So on the horizontal well on the right is we're trying to launch this well. Now, as you're about landing the well from the from the heel of the well, what we notice is that the neutron density begins to close up very fast and it's closing up shallower than the depth the pilots well saw it. So if it's closing up shallow, does it mean this contact has changed? So that became another concern. The contact, if the contact was going to change, it should be, it was just very few, few meters away from the pilot's world. So what would have changed the contact? So when there's no fault or anything that should have changed it from all our investigation into the seismic, the model and all of that, or properties. So we went on to now look at, oh, the, the likelihood that these limestones and these calcite are now having effect on the neutron density law. So we went on to plot the carbon count ratio. And here we have the carbon count ratio, we have the pilot's well. Is exactly falling within this oil zone. If you look at the pilot's well, falling right within the oil zone. Then when we look at the horizontal landing, that's the entry point. We notice that what we are still in the gas zone. So that gives us the inference that, well, this contact that we thought is actually shallower, it is not shallower. What is actually bringing those close market we're seeing on those on, on that uh, respect to that uh, motif of the log on the neutral density is actually coming from the effect from those limestone and calcite, limestone streaks and calcite. Because they are localized, you can't really tell. So sometimes if you're the, the log is not able to, able to capture them. And before they can come back, get to the model logging uh, units, they come in very small, small amounts that you can't really tell the, the effect. So for us now factor that in, we're able to identify that we need to go deeper. If we stop at this point, we'll actually be going to be landing and well in the gas zone. So what we did was we went deeper than that and went back to the initial plan where the pilots were was supposed to take us where we plan to where we plan to link the world rest of the pilots were. And when we did that, this is what we got. So we have the green. The green line is the is the plot, the carbon count ratio plot for the actual final world that was three. So the blue line is the pilots, well, the green is the actual, why the red is the entry point. That's the first hill that we're supposed to enter from before we start uh, building to drop. At this point, at, at building to hold, I mean, at this point, you begin to see that whatever we've done so far, the carbon count ratio has helped us to actually, you know, be able to optimize our well planning and placement into the oil leg. If we had not integrated this carbon count ratio, it might have become a bit challenging because at that point, the neutron density wasn't giving us what we expect. It was already good showing us that we're in, you know, because when we see it closing like that, we're already assuming that it was going to be an oil zone. Well, in real essence, the contact has not shifted. We were still on the same contact, but the carbon count ratio was able to help us to identify that. Fine, you need to go deeper and place your well based on what your pilot well has seen. So I come back again to reiterate these limitations of uh, using the carbon, the carbon count ratio and the things that need to be factored in anytime using the carbon count ratios aside from you using that plot. So the first one there again is that the productive dark dry gas zones may show only C1. So sometimes you only have only C1, that's the methane gas, only showing up. It is also telling you that it is gas. So it mustn't have all the other components coming up for you to know that it is gas. But it's, in cases where it is now so abnormally high, it can just indicate that what you're dealing with is a salt water. So sometimes you can have flush, flushing of salt water coming in to replace fresh water. That is actually, you know, another effect. And also we can have, if the C1 C2 ratio falls low in the oil section and the C1 C4 ratio falls very high in the gas section, the zone is probably a non-productive zone. If any ratio is lower than a preceding ratio, the zone is probably also not productive. For instance, if C1 C4 ratio is less than C1 C2, the zone is probably worse. The ratios may not be definitive for tight and low permeability zones. So in conclusion, this study has shown that gas chromatography carbon count ratio has proven to be one of the significant data that can be integrated in formation evaluation during drilling and also after drilling. Its limitation all, should always be factored in when carrying out fluid differentiation, especially when you're using the PISLA plot. Limestone streaks and calcite minerals can create difficulty in separating oil and gas zones using neutron density crossover, especially when you're playing your landing your well into the horizontal section. It is necessary to integrate carbon count ratio data with other data to get a more reliable formation evaluation result. So you don't, you don't just work with the carbon count ratio alone, you have to integrate with other data as we've, as we've done here 
have to look at other logs, the gamma ray resistivity, the deep residential resistivity, neutron density, NMR, pressure, deep pressure gradients, all of that, to be sure you're able to get something you know, of, of high value that can actually depict what this uh, reservoir is actually saying, if it is oil, if it is gas, or if it is both of them. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, David. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we can all see that David has done justice to this particular topic. I know that in the course of presentation, maybe some of us might have one question or one comment to make. Please, the stage is open now for that. But before I do that, please, you can indicate by raising your hand so that when you are called upon then, you cannot go on and uh, ask your question or make your comment. Then you can as well also send text if you can. Now at this time, the floor is open for question. We are now doing question and answer period. Thank you. Okay, Julius, go ahead. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, Madam President, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, uh, sorry, please, before you uh, ask the or make a please uh, introduce yourself, please. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. My name is Julius uh, Adesun from Lagos. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. David, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. I, I, I just want to find out uh, based on the uh, third bullet point in your conclusion. Uh, I, I wanted to find out that the wireline uh, data that was acquired, I don't know if uh, they eventually used uh, limestone matrix density uh, in the process of uh, acquiring that data or is the typical uh, sandstone matrix density because that might have, in a way, contributed to the balloon effect, effect uh, differences between when you are in, within sandstone and the area where you have a limestone streak. So that's first question. And then uh, the, I, I don't know, do you want to take that before I ask the second one? We can go ahead. Okay, the second the second question is uh, the zone where uh, was, uh, possibly interpreted as uh, not uh, producible. I don't know could that be uh, as a result of a low permeability. Was there any attempt to do um, uh, to acquire mobility test data to actually uh, determine uh, if uh, that uh, that uh, particular zone can be further frack, uh, just to stay uh, uh, extract from such a zone. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Julius. I yeah, appreciate your um, David. Uh, yeah, I can hello, you. David. Uh, before, uh, let yes, me just make a remark. After your response, okay. after your response to this question, uh, I'd like to allow the president to come in with our comments before we take the next uh, questions. Mr. Chairman, do allow that. Yeah. Yes, you're yes, go, so ahead. go ahead. It's okay. It's go okay. ahead. Take the rest. Go ahead. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, so for the, thank you very much, uh, Julius. So for the range in terms of neutron density for the limestone scale and all of that, we noted first our field is dominantly the sand. So it was the sandstone uh, uh, scale that was, make these, that was made use of. So the, 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 the limestone streak you're saying is not like it's, uh, it's, it's the main primary thing we're dealing with for us to now start working with the limestone matrix. But rather working with the sandstone with the, with the, with the, with the mindset that there are a likelihood because if you look at the pilots, well, the place where we even have the hydrocarbon itself, the reservoir itself, there is no we don't we didn't find any limestone in terms of in, in, in terms of uh, having a streaks of limestone, but we have the perception that from other worlds around those limestone varies, they move, they are not steady. So you have them here and there in the horizontal, and they're not very extensive. So work with the 
the, the sandstone matrix that we have, but bearing in the mind that the limestone is possibly going to show up itself. So whenever we are actually doing that, we try to intertwick both from, from, you know, from you can always from your log, you can always adjust your scale. You have to go to limestone matrix or to sandstone matrix. But whichever one it is, there are uncertainties there because you're combining, it's intertwined, you're having uh, the, the limestone embedded into the sandstone and it's just uh, in scattered locations. And the second question I talked about, why is it classified as a uh, non-producible? Well, the PISA plot, first of all, shows it's non-producible. And if you look at the ranges, the way it goes from, from oil to gas to non-producible zone actually tells you that it's not producible. Then if it's for immobility data, yes, we actually had immobility data there and it actually shows that it is not actually, they don't have mobile phones there. So it's confirmed that it is non-producible. Yeah, uh, thank you, David. My president, please. All right then, yes, good morning. Uh, for Taco chapter. Good morning, NAPE members. Good morning, uh, NAPE ESCO members on this call and the honorable fellows that have graced this occasion. Uh, thank you uh, for all of you uh, for helping us to keep to our ideals, which is that we must use this season to train ourselves, uh, to train ourselves in the things that we do not know that will help us as we continue in this uh, energy transition journey. Uh, to train ourselves to unlearn the things uh, that had worked in the past or might not uh, uh, be relevant into our new future that we are envisioning for ourselves. And also uh, to keep uh, NAPE activities alive and bubbling. I really appreciate uh, each and every one of, every one of you. Uh, to the presenter, uh, thank you very much uh, for sharing from your wealth of knowledge. And I believe that the interactive sessions that will follow this will definitely uh, add value to every NAPI member. Uh, the mission of my ESCO is to see that we add value to each and every one of you. And we are trying to do this by bringing in these uh, um, chapter webinars, uh, topics, and also we bring up uh, things, topical interests, topical subjects that uh, would uh, impact uh, the lives and well-being of uh, NAPE members. And so please uh, keep on uh, being plugged in to NAPE. Our conference is coming. Uh, we have a full slate of activities that we um, pick everybody's uh, interest. And uh, I believe there will be other announcements. And I would like to leave uh, one thought here. That NAPE is an association that belongs to you that belongs to me. And we all have to be actively involved in one shape or form or the other. Uh, not necessarily by running for election, that is one way. We can also seek for volunteer opportunities uh, to make our association that which we have envisioned it to be. And with that, I want to appreciate everyone for the time you have put in today. And I bid you a good afternoon. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, my president. So we are back to, uh, to the um, technical session, discussion. Please, more questions or comments, please. Yeah, I think someone is raising his hand. Yes, Which was uh, okay. Go. Oh, figure. Oh, oh, go ahead. We oh, will repeat that. Go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, go ahead. You can hear you. Okay, uh, I want to say thanks to Dr. David. And uh, when I actually saw the topic, I was sort of, uh, I was moved because <clears throat> I've applied similar uh, uh, procedure in the past, although it my first time, that was like uh, 10 years ago. 
and we had some challenges applying this in real time, like decision making, because the we are applying it uh, for a PTP study, that like proximity to pay, which is another way to look at uh, the use of uh, uh, gas uh, gas ratios, the wetness and balance ratio. So, one, the first, my first comment here is to say thanks, uh, David, for clearly delineating delineating uh, the limitations when we apply. Uh, the gas co uh, chromatography uh, uh, evaluation uh, techniques in terms of uh, looking at formation evaluation and fluid fill. But just to make everyone on the call understand that, yes, you can do it for a reservoir. And you can also do it for uh, oil kitchen and analysis, uh, basically, or fluid fill uh, uh, missed or bypassed uh, opportunities. It's not only when you sit in a known reservoir but you can actually apply it along the entire way and you find out that uh, you may pick up signals to show that you are actually uh, maybe sitting close to an oil kitchen or a gas uh, 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 pot. So thanks, uh, uh, David. But just that we need to be mindful of the limitations in making uh, real-time decisions because you understand that you're looking at gas. So there's more additives that come into uh, these uh, 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 chromatographic evaluations. But just for us to understand that uh, we need to work closely with the model logging company and the model engineer when we take this data for some corrections in terms of additives that could actually spike your data. Uh, beside that, I want to say thanks, uh, Dr. David, and thanks, uh, Nati Potaka. All right, thank you very much for the video. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I don't know if any other person has a question or comment, or maybe you have tried this, you want to share your experience with us, please, the floor is open. But before that, uh, I think the electoral board, maybe you can go with your uh, update uh, to keep us abreast of what is going on, please. If you're there, the floor is open for you. Okay. Um, I don't know uh, whether uh, Dr. Edet, do you have something for us? Yeah, thank you very much, GD, for bringing me in. Um, let me first of all say, uh, on behalf of the president of NAPE, this is Patricia Ojobu, members of the executive uh, of NAPE and fellows, uh, thank you all. I think the president has um, said all that is necessary as we are basically um, at the national. We also appreciate what the chapters are doing and we continue to say a very big thank you because it brings to uh, the generality of NAPE members, um, some of these key issues in our operations. So on that note, I say a very big thank you to Dr. David Anomnese. Uh, this topic has been very, in fact, it has been very well articulated. Uh, and even people who have um, worked on this before um, like uh, Vigo Irifeta uh, has, has told us, um, it's, it's shed a lot more light. So we are looking at the situation where we are learning new things every day. And well, like the president said, try to unlearn the other things that uh, have worked in the past but are not working so well. So I would say a very big thank you. Um, for me, as a geologist, um, I mean, Chidi will know this very well. 
because he has been on the rigs and uh, the issue of gas chromatography is always one that most people have been skeptical about. But I, I think that the way Dr. David has put it um, has been very well articulated and it makes it even more uh, uh, interesting to me personally and I am sure to a lot of us uh, will take a second look at uh, this and uh, try to uh, incorporate this in most of our work. Um, it's all good because it means NAPE is bringing to its uh, uh, professionals uh, in the industry something that is uh, worth the while and new. And um, uh, uh, let me say an improvement uh, on what we used to know. So for those of us who are uh, skeptical of this uh, sort of uh, work, we now know better. And I want to thank Dr. David for bringing this to us. Um, there isn't much more that we can say ex except uh, that we will continue to learn and NAPE will continue to strive to bring to the uh, generality of its members all the good things that will help us um, go through this uh, energy transition. And of course, I don't even know if uh, to call this uh, uh, a transition because uh, we are forever going to be relevant, whether it's going to be uh, uh, renewables or we are still going to do oil and gas, um, whatever it is, I see the role of ge geologists and geoscientists uh, being uh, forever present as far as we are going to be making uh, economic inroads for the country. And uh, I, I'm sure NAPE will be at the forefront of this. So thank you very much uh, for giving me that opportunity to say a few words to you. And I hope we have learned something. And um, thank you very much, Chidi. Over to you. OK, thank you, uh, JJ. Thank you, Dr. Um, thank you. Yep. Um, but, uh, um, David. Yes, I can hear you. <coughs> so. Can you copy me? Um, I'm not hearing you clearly at the moment. I can't hear you clearly at the moment. You're breaking. I don't know if that is from me. Or from Hello. Uh, so I don't know if it's me that is breaking or uh, Hello, Chidi. Um, Emma, um, my page is chair. I think you can take over and oh, network okay. if network can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, yeah, okay, can I can you. hear you now. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know whether it's for me or for you. I think it's what's from you, Chidi. Oh, yeah, I can oh, hear you, yes. Oh, oh. Okay, David, I want to ask, uh, I don't know, uh, okay. maybe you did not, uh, maybe to slide, or whether I didn't consider that maybe as regards to the acquisition of uh, chromatography, the effect of that is used in drilling. I don't know what did you, whether you consider that for this presentation or is it outside this presentation? Sorry, can, can you repeat? Uh, you broke at the time. Okay, I'm saying uh, as regards the uh, acquisition of uh, data, data acquisition. I mean, 
Express Chromatography. Chidi, we can't really hear you. Maybe you can type it. Yeah, Whether I think it, 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 it's 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 breaking. That, the type of okay. mod that is used in drilling. Okay, okay, okay. I think I get the question. Chidi, because Chidi, I get hear me. More. Okay. I know that mud used in drilling. Chidi, you are coming. And also very affect poor, very the total poor. gas. Okay. I, I, I think I, David, I get were you able to yes, get yes, I was able to get what uh, Chidi okay, was okay, asking. Okay. I can I got what he's asking. Okay. So what yeah. uh, Chidi, let me just repeat what he's trying to say. Well what what he's saying is um the type of mod that was used in the drilling, have I considered what effect it has on the acquisition data as on acquiring the gas, uh, the gas count uh, data, of uh, which he okay. is comparing, for instance, if it is an oil-based mod, what the composition is of that oil-based mod, what effect can it have to the total gas and the carbon? So I, basically, I didn't consider that. But all the data I've showed so far is coming from, from an oil-based mod drilling. Because I know many a times uh, in the Niger Delta, we make use of oil-based mode, unlike uh, uh, the water-based mode that is being used on the shallower depths. But as you get to your deeper intervals where you have the, the hydrocarbon bearing intervals, you make use of the oil-based mode for rheology and for many others, just to have a better whole, whole management strategy and uh, all of that. But I've not considered that one. I've not actually looked into that. But I know there are a lot of composition, so it depends on the percentage of the you know the oil in the oil based mode itself and all of that, but I've not checked what effect it has. But one thing I've noticed is that I just uh, believe if you're working with the carbon, okay, the gas commercial carbon carbon depending on the units you're working with, if it is in percentage or in, in pounds per, per per million, whichever one you're working with, you just need to look at the ratio. If the ratios are falling in place, then that means it's something a reliable data to work with. But if the ratios are falling out of, for instance, if you have a carbon count ratio that is giving you over 1,000, that is actually looking, you know, so for instance, C1, C2, C1 over C2, you have C1 over C2 over 1,000, it's looking so uh, so high, and uh, you might not totally want to trust that one. Or having the C1, C3 that is getting up to like uh, 7,000 or 8,000. So in those cases, you know that oh, there might be an issue here. It's possibly either from the mod or even the, 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 even the gas chromatography equipment itself. Maybe it has not been properly calibrated. So the very first thing that you have to do for the mod loggers who are actually on the rig to during the drilling process, they have to be sure that their, 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 their gas unit is properly calibrated. So that when any data is passing through it, as the data as your gases are coming in from your total gas, you can begin to see the effects on its breaking of into different components from the C1 to C5. Okay, okay, thank you, David. Thank you very much. Uh, I think my voice sounds clearer now. Yes, it's better now. Okay, good. Thank you very much. I don't know whether any other person, any other question, comment before we call it a day. Okay. Um, There's a hand from the, Ingo from the UK. That's a okay, 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 Tare Ingo. Okay, okay how do you go ahead? Yeah, let me duly observe uh, all the protocols. Uh, my name is uh, Tara Ingo once more. Um, I've been an ex uh, mod logger, uh, data engineer, report project engineer uh, for 15 uh, years uh, before uh, uh, switching uh, into a well site uh, geology uh, road with uh, sterling oil exploration energy production company in uh, Nigeria. Uh, before taking a stint uh, to come and pursue MSc in uh, petroleum and wildlife sciences. Uh, uh, the University of uh, Liverpool, which I've completed and currently doing the renewable energy uh, in the PhD uh, year also in the UK. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. David, for this uh, beautiful uh, presentation. Uh, uh, what I have is just a uh, comment. You know, from experience, uh, you know, mod logging uh, data, gas uh, data from the mod logging. Uh, uh, access is uh, very critical to this uh, uh, gas uh, ratio evaluation. Uh, but some of the uh, drawbacks uh, of getting that uh, data directly uh, is uh, we have uh, issues at uh, most times uh, with uh, the gas uh, uh, calibration, you know. So 
for you to effectively use uh, this uh, data you're talking uh, uh, from the mod login uh, unit, I think the very the the, the best uh, and the most accurate uh, uh, source of that uh, uh, data uh, from experience is uh, the one we've gotten uh, during the uh, MDT uh, runs. You no, know? they are really quite uh, different from uh, what uh, we uh, saw. You know, in, in terms of uh, the, the 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 percentage of composition, you no, know, uh, of the gas uh, 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 chromatography, you know. Uh, so I don't know. I think you need to consider uh, that uh, uh, also. Although uh, MDT uh, uh, runs are quite expensive, you know, uh, but for you to get reliable uh, stuff, uh, information from that uh, GC uh, data. I will find out that uh, what we got uh, from uh, the MDT uh, and gas uh, data was uh, more more accurate. Most accurate, it was uh, very surprising. I've tested it in several uh, study the oil uh, development uh, uh, wells. You know, then we also found that that uh, uh, the composition of your of your drilling uh, fluid is very critical to uh, to this. So during uh, drilling. Uh, during the drilling uh, uh, phase, uh, much of uh, the gas uh, may be masked uh, as a result of one the the, the, the mud weights, you know, the mud weights and uh, also the composition. Uh, so we need to factor all this uh, into our uh, analysis to come up with um, uh, very accurate That's and uh, more workable results. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tari. I really appreciate your contribution. Okay, thank you, Tare Ingo. I think uh, we are going to call it a day at this point. Um, Mr. Chairman. Um, sir. Yeah, before we call it a day, uh, we all know that, uh, or most of us are aware, that uh, just a few days back, two days ago, we lost one of our own. Uh, that's in the person of uh, Professor Adek Pelumi of uh, the Obafemi Awolowo University, uh, Ileife. I'd like us to observe a minute silence in honor of our prolific professor, a colleague that we've worked together in different teams in NAPE. Uh, I'd like us to just observe a minute of silence, please. May the gentle soul of Professor Adekule Abraham Adekbelumi rest in perfect peace in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And uh, today, do we have the, the, the uh, electoral uh, board chairperson on board to give us a brief on the status with elections? She's not, she's not online. She's not online. Oh. Okay, okay, you can just uh, run through your your uh, uh, the announcements we have there, the messages you have for us. Just uh, run through them from the secretariat. Yeah, Tunde, go ahead. Okay, so let me just share part of the information for the election. I believe you can see my screen. Yes. 2021-2022 NAPI election will commence by September 1st, 2021. So we advise all active members, pay up your dues if you have not done that, and vote starting from September 1st, 2021. And by October 15, the election will be wrapped up. So the candidates for the elections, as you can see on my screen, for the president-elect, a one-year term, we have uh, Mr. Elliot Ibe. He works with Shell Petroleum Development Company. And for the vice president, another uh, ESCO position that is vacant, 
for one year. We have a uh, Dr. Anthony Ofoma from Aliportin Energy Services, Nigeria Limited. So when you go to the website, you click on the link to buy, you will see their details there. And for the university assistance programs, chairman, it's for two years. Uh, we have Dr. Dele Farebita from the Obafemi Awolowo University, Leife. You click on the bow, you will see his details there. And we also have Mr. Philip Ajaybili, Shell Petroleum Development Company is his affiliation. You click on the bow on the website, you see his details there. So only financial up-to-date active members are actually eligible to vote. So if you know you have not paid your annual dues, please kindly do, do so. And for the inquiries about dues payment, you can call on our membership officer, uh, Ms. Abiyayua Ubebo. Our email is on the screen, abiyayua.o at nape.org.ng. So that is what we have for the election that is starting tomorrow, September 1st. So please start voting, pay your dues, and uh, exercise your voting rights. So that's what I have for from the Secretariat for now. Thank you very much. The Editor-in-Chief, uh, Dr. Jackson, would like to talk about the conference program. OK, briefly, uh, Dr. Jackson. Very much. Uh, I would just love to share uh, a couple of uh, details that we need to know around the conference. Uh, please confirm you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, go ahead, I can hear you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, the conference uh, program uh, has been put together and uh, in November 14th to uh, 18th, NAPE Annual International Conference and Exhibition comes up. It's uh, going to be hybrid conference. Uh, we'll be having the uh, physical component and the virtual component of it. And uh, from technical programs, as I speak to Ross, uh, if you submitted abstracts for presentation during the conference, you must have received your acceptance letter. Please do well to um, revert uh, by confirming your presence to make your presentation during the conference, whether virtually or uh, physically, so that uh, we can plan effectively and uh, also register for the conference because uh, uh, presentation is not allowed if uh, registration has not been made. So everyone has to register for the conference. The conference venue is actually a, a cohort health and suite for this year, but it's open to uh, virtual attendees if you wish to uh, attend virtually. So uh, thank you very much. Other programs uh, will be brought your way. At the moment, from the technical uh, front, you are to uh, put together and uh, send across your full paper. And uh, that is where we are at our schedule at the moment. Thank you very much. Mr. Thank Tunde, over to you. Uh, the editor in chief, I have my peers. Uh, peers, please, very quickly, the remaining announcements. You are the repository of all your knowledge. Good afternoon, everyone. Please, can you give me the right to share my screen quickly so that we can run through? Uh, I know that most of the announcements would have been taken, but I will just run through the other ones. So, please give me the right to share my screen. Thank you. Okay. Please confirm you can see my screen. Yes, we can see it. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, 
I, I hate to be a key man risk to that pay. And I'm um, hoping that our PSCs can also do this while, uh, you know, their chapters have activities such as this. So for announcements, I came in when Sunday was talking about the electoral process. So yes, that's out really so. Uh, from tomorrow, you will start to see the NAPE official posters for this election. And we would like that you please exercise your right as a member to vote. You must have seen this before. This keeps getting bigger. Uh, it's a feature of the president and the media party that she has had in recent past. Yesterday, we also attended the uh, Nigeria Oil and Gas Outlook, where she gave a keynote speech. This is what August looked like. Thank you so much for handing August for us on a very great note. I uh, couldn't make the technical meeting, but I'm sure that it was a great session knowing uh, Dr. David and Omneze. This is what our September is looking like. Voting starts tomorrow, the portal will be open and we have various technical meetings. Our NMGS conference is also happening this month from the 22nd to the 26th. That's from Wednesday to Sunday. Uh, in this month of September, we are using the opportunity of course to also launch the sponsor a student drive. If you belong to an alma mater in Nigeria, it's an opportunity for you to get in touch with a faculty advisor in the school or speak to Abiyewa, who is our membership officer to sponsor students to this conference. The price is 10,000 Naira. We have a physical event coming up in Lagos this season, uh, and that's on the 29th. It's going to be hosted by ATIAD, and we'd like to have you there. I'm going to just skip this quickly. When you get to the voting platforms, which link will be shared in your email before the end of today, please assess the link. If you need to ensure that your membership is still up to date, please click on the members only and try to log in with your email and your password combination. You can use the forgot password if you're having issues and please follow the instructions to vote. There are two methods to vote with one more preferred. The most preferred is the e-voting. The balloting by paper, the voting by ballot paper would be treated only on exceptional cases. So if you need that, you need to speak to the electoral committee chairperson very quickly. These are the official flyers that I said you'll be seeing very soon. This is Dr. Antonio Foma who is contesting for the seats. Interestingly, he is the only one vying for the seat of the vice president. The same thing with Mr. Elliot Ibe, who is vying for the seat of the president-elect in Nape. And we have uh, Mr. Philip Ajaybile and Dr. Delif Balibita contesting for the UAP chairperson's seats. September 7, if you had seen the the September calendar. We have the worry chapter. They will be having their own technical presentation. Please connect with us on our social platforms and all the other to which communicate with you for the joining link and read more about the abstract and the profile of the presenter as well. 16th of September, which will be the week after that on a Wednesday, we also have the NAPE UK Europe chapter delivering another technical meeting and uh, the topic is as shown. The link to register is also shown and you'll also find it on all our various platforms and also in your email box. We have the erstwhile late Professor S.W. Peters. Uh, the technical session for this month will be in his honor and it is being sponsored by the Uyo Calabar chapter, however, it will be held as a Lagos event, but this will be virtual. The chairman for this event is Mr. Biodo Andesoya, the CEO of DG Connect, Hefnope, uh, which you all know. So we are enjoying that you please join in and let's talk about the hidden treasures of the African Rift Basins in Nigeria and the Niger Petroleum Systems. This has been talked about. Please sponsor a student from your alma mater, contact Abiyewa for payment and details on the registered NAPE schools, because it is these schools that we will be able to sponsor people from. If you want to know more about the criteria for sponsorship, then we would also ask you to speak. We are where you are pending the time we gather the right information. 
the NAPE conference, I heard Dr. Jackson talking about this, uh, and you'll be seeing a lot more information around this as we move closer. If you're a member of the CPC committee or any of the committees, please stay connected to your committee and really be active in it so that we can plan a successful and a robust conference, hybrid conference at the end of this year. I heard Dr. Mr. Emma made us have a, a one minute silence for this, but this is really just bringing it to your notice that we lost Professor Adek Bellumi on Sunday morning. Uh, details of his burial arrangements is yet to be communicated, uh, but we're commemorating with the family at this time. We can't close any of your session without reminding you that you are the strength of NAPE. Your volunteering, your passion has to come true, but beyond, you know, loving NAPE in your mind, there is something called a social digital currency. Please use this on NAPE, spend this on NAPE. If you happen to be in any of these fiscal or digital spaces, please follow, like, interact with us and play an active role in your community. So it is on this note, I would uh, also mention around, you know, there is this instance call for volunteers every time because NAPE is built on you and I. NAPE needs volunteers to deliver most of its work duties. While the Secretariat tries to put all of our activities together, there's so much to be done. And we're asking you that you please volunteer. Is not, there's no payment to it. It's really like a, a gift of your time and resources, but there is no better place to learn quick leadership skills, soft skill, networking, interpersonal relationship than through volunteer activities. We also have this as a value to our membership. Please, if you need medical insurance, please speak to Sunday at the Secretariat and let him walk you through the features of what we currently have with Venus Medicare Services as an HMO plan for our members. So thank you. I would uh, hand over to Mr. Emo to stay his meeting. I want to thank uh, 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 Chidi for his time. I want to thank uh, David for a wonderful presentation. For all of you that have been part of this meeting, I want to sincerely appreciate you. We look forward to yet another moment with you. Thank you, and have a wonderful day ahead of you. God bless you all. God bless you too. Thank you, Emo. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, my best friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My VP, thank you. Thank you. My PE, thank you. All the SCO members that have been on the team. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. UK, Nigeria, PLC. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Big Ross, for, 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 for sending uh, this uh, information uh, to me, you know. Yeah. I'm very, very uh, grateful to be part of uh, this. Thank you, everybody. Yes, and I appreciate it. Thank, uh, uh, thank you. 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 Thank you.